This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. All right. So let me remind you, so again, the, the topic today, and we'll pick it up again next time, is uh, sampling and interpolation. There's a lot to say, and as with many things, we can't say it all. So I want to get the main ideas across and the main phenomena that are associated with it. It is, our approach to it is going to be an application of what we talked about last time uh, with the Shaw function. So I want to rem remind you of that. So last time we introduced, we introduced this train of delta functions, sometimes also called the Dirac comb or the Dirac train or a pulse train or an impulse train or all sorts of things. We introduced this Shaw function of spacing P sum from, uh, I'll put the variable in there, and I'll remind you of the picture. So sum of delta functions evenly spaced p apart. So k from minus infinity to infinity, delta x minus k p, all right? And it has several important properties that I will list. So the picture is, is a bunch of evenly spaced delta functions all up and down the line. So usually indicated something like this, p, 2p, and so on, minus p, minus 2p, also and so on. All right. There are three very important, and we introduced this in the context of an important physical problem, and, and, a, and a quite an interesting physical problem, that of studying um, x-ray diffraction. All right. The mathematical properties that allowed us to analyze that problem so effectively are the same mathematical properties we're going to use today in a quite different setting. And I want to recall those for you. The three important properties. One is the sampling property. We used each one of these, but now I want to single them out. That is, if I take a function and multiply it by the Shaw function, it samples the function at the points k, p. So f of x times the Shaw function is the sum of f of k, p delta x minus kp. Again, sum from minus infinity to infinity. I'll get out of the way in just a second here. All right. That, the, the, that sampling property of the Shaw function follows from the sampling property of the delta function. So important property of the delta function, shift the delta function. If you multiply the shifted delta by a function, it pulls out the value at the point times the delta function. You can read that well enough here, k times p. So that's the sampling property. Allied with that, sort of the flip side of that is, um, God, my writing is the generator is the periodicity, periodizing property. And that is, uh, has to do with convolution, that if I convolve a function with the Shaw function of spacing p, I get a periodic function of period p. That is, this is the sum of shifted versions of f, k going from minus infinity to infinity, f of x minus kp. All right, so that gives you a periodic function of period p. I'm not worried about here questions about convergence and things like that. I'm just worried about sort of for the formal properties and how they work. They are, in some sense, flip sides of each other, and we'll see that very strongly today, because convolution and multiplication are sort of swapped back and forth by taking the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so in fact, they're actually sort of two sides of the same coin. The final property of the Shaw function, the remarkable property that falls from this. Poisson summation formula, the fact about the integers, is the Fourier transform property. That is the Fourier transform of the Shaw function of spacing P is a Shaw function with reciprocal spacing with an extra factor of 1 over P, 1 over P out in front. Okay? That's a very deep fact. Uh, and let me just say, because I'm actually going to use the corresponding formula for the inverse Fourier transform. So the inverse Fourier transform formula is the same. I'll just write it down. I won't derive it separately. The inverse formula, the inverse Fourier transform of the Shaw function of spacing P is the same thing, 1 over P 
Shaw functional spacing 1 over p. All right, these three properties were the basis for the mathematical analysis of uh, X-ray diffractions we talked about last time, and they're going to be they're going to serve us also today in a, in, a, in quite a different context. So here is the setup for um, the sampling and interpolation problem. Matter of fact, let me call it the interpolation problem. Set up for the interpolation problem. It is not one problem, but rather it's a whole category general problems, which have been considered in different contexts, different ways since time immemorial. Okay. All right. The problem here is, uh, and what we're actually going to solve the, in, in a in a in quite remarkable way is the exact interpolation of values of a function from a discrete set of measurements or a discrete set of samples. So we're going to consider, so this is what we'll do. We'll um, find, we'll be able to interpolate the exact value, the value of all, interpolate all values of a signal or a function from a discrete set of samples. All right. Now in this general, well, we won't be able to do it in this generality. That is, we're going to have to make certain assumptions that are going to allow us to solve it. But even under fairly general assumptions, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surprising that you can do this at all. And it's ridiculous to expect to be able to do it at worst somehow. I mean, it's, to, to ask, ask us a general question, um, is and to expect an answer for it is really uh, maybe asking too much. But in fact, by employing the, the techniques that we've developed, we can actually get an answer for this in fairly great generality and in ex that's extremely important practically. All right, now, um, here's the setup. So here's the, thing, here's the thing to keep in mind. So let me formulate this question again fairly generally and then we'll get to the uh, assumptions that we have to make in order to be able to solve it in a reasonable way. All right. So imagine you have a set of measurement, have a, have a process evolving in time, say. It doesn't have to be time, but that's the easiest way to think about it. A process evolving in time. All right. And you make a set of measurements at equal intervals. some fraction of a second. Time, time intervals. Equal spacing actually turns out to be important in this context. All right, so you have a bunch of measurements, T0, Y0, T1, Y1, T2, Y2, and so on. All right, so you can think of this as a bunch of points. And I want to formulate the question really in two ways. So here's T0. T1, T2, and so on. And here are the corresponding points somehow in the plane, or just plotting them, T3. Now, you might ask, fit a curve to those points. Or what is equivalent, interpolate the values at intermediate points based on the measurements you make. They're really two equivalent ways of formulating it. So you might ask, one, fit a curve to the points, fit a curve to the data. Or you might ask, interpolate the values of the function of the process, whatever it is, the function at intermediate points based on the sample values, based on the points you measure, based on the measurements. All right, those are reasonable questions. Those are questions that are natural to ask. And you can imagine all sorts of contexts for this. And there are many ways of doing it, all right? Matter of fact, if you're doing 263, you've probably talked about least squares approximations to a set of data. We actually don't track the data, but you find somehow the best li the line that best fits the data. But you can imagine, you know, drawing a curve like this. You can imagine doing it with straight lines. 
straight line, uh, I was going to say straight line interpolation, but I'm mixing the two aspects of the problem. But something like this, you know, you could do that. Or you can imagine fitting it with a polynomial or some other kind of curve where you might go up, you might go down, you might go up again somehow, but you want to actually track the values exactly. Okay? But there again, there's not a unique solution for this. There are many ways of doing it depending on the particular problem. Now, all right, so. And again, it's almost silly to prefer, I mean, you may have a reason for preferring one over the other, but you better have an extra argument to justify one choice over another. There are many ways of doing this, many possibilities. All right. And the question is, how would you choose one over the other, or choose any at all, for that matter? How would you, why would you expect to be able to do this? Well, you might want to refine, if it's possible, you might want to refine your options or narrow your options by making more measurements, all right? If possible, you might make more measurements. suggest a better fit or better interpolation or more accurate interpolation, a better fit or more accurate interpolation. Let me make sure, wait a second, let me, interpolation. Let me make sure you know what I mean here when I say interpolation, all right, and what you're, what you're actually getting. If you write down an explicit function or set of functions that tracks this data, then what I, might be in, what I mean by interpolation is that you can find the value at intermediate points, the purported value at intermediate points, by plugging into your formula. All right, so you write down a formula for the straight line that goes from here to here. That means you can find every point on that straight line. You have a formula for that. Likewise, from this straight line, from here to here, and from here to here. Or if you have a polynomial that somehow does this, or maybe does a piecewise thing, goes like that, then you can find the value at any intermediate point by plugging into that formula. That's what I mean by interpolation. All right, so all values are computable by knowing only these discrete values. And it's an approximation. You don't know that's, that, whether that's doing a good job or not doing a good job, all right? But you're making a guess, and you're making it what you hope is a reasonable guess, all right? But that's, that's why I'm saying curve fitting and interpolation are, the, are, are equivalent sort of things. One is a geometric way of looking at it by drawing a curve. The other is an analytic way of formulating it by actually trying to write down a formula for the function that's doing the interpolation and then plug into that formula and seeing how, you, seeing how well it matches, all right? So again, what I mean by this is maybe you can make more measurements and then compare those measurements to your formula. All right, see if it's working. Suggest a better fit or more accurate interpolation. Now, maybe you can do that, maybe you can't. What is the enemy in this, or what is causing, what is causing uncertainty? Well, again, at this level of generality, there's more uncertainty than there is certainty. I mean, you know, you, know, you have a discrete set of values. Who knows what the function is doing in between? But don't stop at, that, at saying that. Try to say a little bit something more positive. That is, the thing that's causing you difficulties, the uncertainty in the values in, in the extreme case, are the oscillations, how fast the function is changing from one value to the other. The, less certain, the, the, the more rapidly the function might be changing, the less certainty you have about interpolating the values in between from the measured values. Okay, so the more bends the function takes, the more rapid bends rapid bends, or the more corners a function has, the more uncertainty you have in your interpolation, in your curve fitting or your interpolation, same thing. All right, now, there's a principle here that I was thinking of when I was, when I was thinking about how to, how to describe this. It's, it's, often, it's often associated with the British mathematician J.E. Littlewood, who was actually one of my mathematical forebears, my mathematical ancestors, which says something like, make your worst enemy your best friend. If you're trying to analyze a situation, make your worst enemy your best friend. Either define him out of existence, <laughs> cause him to change sides or whatever, but identify what the problem is. And, and, and identify, try to identify it as precisely as possible. The problem here in interpolation, in uncertainty, is 
the more rapid the bends are, the more uncertain you are in your interpolation. The more jagged, somehow, the process is between sample points, the less certain you are about how to interpolate between the sample points. All right? So you somehow want to quantify the jaggedness or the, ba or the bends in the, in the process, in the function. Now, we are pretty sophisticated by now in questions like that. So we want to regulate, maybe even get rid of, but at least regulate, understand, quantify somehow. We want to regulate, regulate. Let me put it this way, how rapidly the function, the signal is bending, all right, oscillating. I don't quite know the, the, the right way of saying it, so I don't want the right word for this, but you know what I, I hope you know what I mean, oscillating. All right, between sample values. That's going to be an extra assumption, all right, between sample measurements, between sample values. All right, now this is going to take the form of, a, of, a, of an assumption, but the question is what should the, what should the nature of the, the assumption be? All right, now as I say, we're actually, we've gotten quite sophisticated in this sort of thing. For us, we think in terms of not just the function given in the time domain, but we also think of the function giving in, given in the frequency domain. We think in terms of its Fourier transform. The Fourier transform in representing the function in terms of its frequencies, in terms of its frequency components, tells us something about how fast the function is oscillating. If it has high frequencies, high frequencies are just as for Fourier transform, just as for Fourier series, high frequencies are associated with rapid oscillations, low frequencies with smaller oscillations, less rapid oscillations. And so if we want to make an assumption that's going to eliminate rapid oscillations, we might make that assumption in the frequency domain. That is, it should be an assumption on the Fourier transform. So this is governed by, this is a spectral property. So it's governed by the Fourier transform. All right. That is, an assumption on how rapidly the function is oscillating is an assumption on the Fourier transform. That's one way of saying this a little bit more precisely. All right, now, go right to this maybe perhaps the simplest assumption you can make along these lines. It takes a little experience to know that this is the simplest assumption. But the idea is you want to eliminate all, one, I mean, one way, of, one way of thinking about this is you want to eliminate all frequencies beyond a certain point. All right, so that's one, so one possibility. You know, you're trying to analyze this. Maybe, maybe this one is a good idea. Maybe there are other ones that are good ideas. I'll give you a clue. This turns out to be a good idea. One possibility is to eliminate, that is to assume, is to, is to, elim is to, to, to eliminate all frequencies beyond a certain point. That is by an assumption. All right. Now, so we assume many times, if this is what you want to get to, then make that a definition. Concentrate your attention for the interpolation problem on functions which satisfy a property like this. We are ready for an important definition. This is the, the problem we want to study is the interpolation problem. Interpolating the exact value of the function in between measured values by the measured values. The enemy, the problem is rapid oscillation between those measured values. Our approach to that problem, to resolving that uncertainty, is to say, I'm going to regulate how rapidly the function is allowed to oscillate. And I'm going to phrase that as an assumption on the Fourier transform of the function. All right, because the assumption on the, assumption on the Fourier transform is an assumption on the frequency components. If you eliminate high frequencies, you're, you feel like you're eliminating rapid oscillations. And I'm going to state that as a definition. So you say a function f of t is band limited if its Fourier transform is identically zero outside some band of frequencies. That is, f of s, the, the Fourier transform of s is identically zero 
for s greater than or equal to p over 2. I'm going to write it like that, all right? You'll see why in a little bit. For some p. And then the smallest such p is called the bandwidth. The smallest such p for which this is true the bandwidth. All right, so the picture is that the Fourier transform is identically zero outside some finite interval. And I'm working with real functions here, so the Fourier transform is symmetric, so that's why I, do, I have absolute values. You can give the definition more generally, but this, this is the most natural setting for it. So here's the picture. Here's 0, here's p over 2, here's minus p over 2. And whatever the Fourier transform does in between, and it can't do that exactly because it's supposed to be in, ma in magnitude, at least it's supposed to be symmetric, it's 0 outside there. All right? This is the Fourier transform. All right, so that is supposed to capture the idea that you are limiting the size of the frequencies. You are limiting in the time domain the oscillation of the function by making this assumption in the frequency domain. OK. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you that for band-limited signals, you can solve the interpolation problem exactly. It's remarkable. For band-limited signals, you can solve the interpolation problem exactly. You get a formula for all values of the function in terms of a sequence, a discrete sequence of measured values or samples. You get a formula for f of t for all t for all t in terms of the values of f at a discrete set of points, t, let me just call them t sub k, sampled values. All right. You can fit that curve exactly. That is to say, if you know the process comes from a function which is band limited, you can write down a formula for the function. All right, now, in the notes, there's a different sort of discussion of this. I'm going to go right for the kill. <laughs> All right, I'm going to show you how this works. And, it, and it's nothing short of remarkable. It's almost obscene the way this thing works, I think. It's the most remarkable, I think it's the most remarkable argument in the whole subject, practically. And I say it's one of my favorite arguments because it's just, it's obscene. And, Makes me feel cheap and dirty. You know, it's great. God. Um, the notes has uh, a, a discussion of this. It goes a little bit farther, right? And I, I'm not going to go through that. That is in terms of trigonometric functions, why you would expect something like this to occur, what you, what, why you might expect something like this to occur in different, different circumstances. And we may, we'll, we'll go back, we'll circle back and talk about some of these things. But for right now, I want to go, as I say, right for that kill. I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to give you the argument. And it involves exactly the periodizing property of the Shaw function and the sampling property of the Shaw function and the, and the, and the Fourier transform property of the Shaw function. Those three properties come into this in a, in a, in a very essential way. All right, so again, here's the picture in the frequency. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do this, all right? And there's, there's no, I mean, there's no way of saying it other than I'm going right for the kill and just watch, enjoy the ride, all right? Enjoy the experience because it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing to see this thing unfold. All right, so here's a picture in the frequency domain again. In the frequency domain. The picture is like this. So I'm assuming the signal is band limited. So that means the Fourier transform only is non-zero between minus p over 2 and p over 2. It might have some zeros in here, OK? All right, it might have some, I'm not saying it doesn't have any zeros in between, but I'm saying that for sure, it's identically zero outside this interval. 
All right. Now I'm going to use the Shaw function with spacing p to periodize, periodize this. All right. By convolution. That is, I look at. Let me draw the picture for you. I look at the Fourier transform of f convolved with the Shaw function of spacing p. All right, so what is the picture? The picture is here's the Fourier transform minus p over two to p over two. I'm going to make it a little bit more condensed here. Minus p over two to p over two. All right. Here's the Shaw function with spacing p. So there's a delta function there. This is p over two. The next delta function is at p. The delta function over here is at minus p, and so on and so on. All right. Here's zero. All right. Now, what does it do? What, what do you do when you can when you convolve that? When you convolve the Shaw function with this, it shifts it by p and adds it all up. All right. So the picture of the convolution of the Fourier transform of the Shaw function looks something like this. Here's minus. Here's zero. Here's minus p over two. P over two. It shifts the whole thing over to p down to minus p and so on. So you get just a bunch of repeating patterns of the thing. But there's no overlap because the um, Fourier transform is 0 outside of the interval from minus p over 2 to p over 2. So if you shift it by p, there is no overlap when you, um, when you, when you convolve. All right. There's no overlap. All right. Now, if there's no overlap, what I'm going to do is to get to recover the original Fourier transform. I'm going to cut off by a, by a rectangle function of the same width of width p. So I get back the original Fourier transform by cutting off cutting off. That is to say, with multiplying by the rectangle function of spacing p. All right. Algebraically, that's just pi sub p times the Fourier transform of f convolved with the Shaw function of p. And I say that that gives you back the original Fourier transform. So again, the picture is you have all these spectral islands that are repeated up and down the line but not overlapping, and so on. And then minus p over 2 to p over 2. And then you cut off by a rectangle function of that width, width p, going from minus p over 2 to p over 2. So it's 1 in between and 0 outside that interval. And that gives you the original Fourier transform. All right. Now you say, brilliant. You have done something and you have undone something. This takes a PhD? Yeah. Where? No, this should not be convolution. It should be multiplication. I'm multiplying by a function which is 1 on the interval from minus p over 2 to p over 2 and 0 outside that interval. So that, rec that, re that, that gets back the original Fourier transform. All right? The original Fourier transform is here, and it's only there. All right? It's only there. When you convolve it, you get a bunch of repeating patterns. You add them all up, but you cut those off. All right? You cut those off. And that, that leaves you with this, which is the original Fourier transform. This is the whole ball game. All right? The most important equation here is exactly this equation. I'll write it down again. The Fourier transform of f is the cutoff of the periodized Fourier transform. All right, again, you say, <laughs> great, you have done something, you have undone something. You, know, you got a PhD for this. This is why they call you a professor. Now, take the inverse Fourier transform. Looks like you haven't done anything, but have actually you've done something extremely significant. Because by taking the inverse Fourier transform, it swaps multiplication and convolution. This is the picture in the frequency domain. What is happening in the time domain? So take 
the inverse Fourier transform. Well, on the left-hand side, the inverse Fourier transform, the inverse of the Fourier transform is just f. So f is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of f. Right, that's fine. Now take the inverse Fourier transform. That gives you back the original function, because I'm taking the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform. All right? The inverse Fourier transform of the right-hand side, again, it swaps. Let's do this a little bit at a time here. It swaps convolution and multiplication. That is to say, it takes multiplication back to convolution. The this is the inverse Fourier transform of the rectangle function convolved with the inverse Fourier transform of this. Follow along, enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride. All right? All right, let's look at this part here. Well, I'll write it out a little bit, one, one, one step at a time. The inverse Fourier transform of the rect function is a scaled sinc function. The inverse Fourier transform of the rect function in spacing P is P sinc PT. If you don't believe me, figure it out yourself. All right? The inverse Fourier transform of this, again, is going to swap convolution and multiplication. The inverse Fourier transform of of the Fourier transform involved with the Shaw function is going to be the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform. Oops, too many Fs. Of the Fourier transform of F times the inverse Fourier transform of the Shaw function. Times. Okay? No, we stated the convolution theorem. I don't know if I stated it. I'm sure it's in the notes. We stated the convolution theorem in terms of the forward Fourier transform. Same thing holds in terms of the inverse Fourier transform. Okay? Swaps convolution and multiplication. All right. Now, once again, the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform is just the function. The inverse Fourier transform of the Shaw function of spacing P is a Shaw function of spacing 1 over P. So this is f of t times 1 over P times the Shaw function of spacing 1 over P times at t. I guess I'm using t for my variable here. OK, now I could combine all the formulas at once here, but let me not do that. Let me take this one step further. Now remember, now we're going to use the sampling property of the Shaw function. We use the periodiz periodizing property of the Shaw function in the frequency domain when we periodize the, forward, the, the Fourier transform. Now in the time domain, I'm going to use the sampling property of the Shaw function. All right, if I multiply f of t times this, now remember, let me, I'll take this out one more step before you say remember what it is. 1 over p, that's a constant. That just comes out in front of the whole thing. It's 1 over p times f of t times the sum of deltas, minus infinity to infinity, spaced 1 over p apart, t minus k over p. All right? So what is the sampling property of the Shaw function? If you multiply f times that, that is 1 over p times the sum k going from minus infinity to infinity, f of k over p, f at the sample point times the corresponding delta function, delta t minus k over p. All right, sample values are coming in. The values of f at discrete set of points is coming in, are coming in at this step because of the sampling property of the Shaw function. All right, now let's look back to where we were up there. I now have that f of t is um, p times the sinc pt convolved with that sum. 1 over p, there's a 1 over p out in front, sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity f of k over p delta t minus k over p. All right. Now I use the shifting property of the delta function. So it's this fixed function, p times sine pt, convolved with this sum of deltas. All right? So I'll take this out one more. Step the p. The p cancels with the 1 over p. So this is sum k equals minus infinity to infinity. These are constants, f of k over p times the sinc function, the scaled sinc function, convolved with delta t minus k over p. 
All right? And now you use the shifting property of the delta function and write this as the sum of the sampled values, that is the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, f of k over p times the sink of p t minus k over p. Which is actually the way I prefer to write this, but many people write it like this. They, they write it, they multiply through by p. Sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, f of k over p, sink of pt minus k. We're done. We're done. We found a formula for the function at all values of t in terms of its sampled values. I'll write it down. It was a long chain of equalities here. We have shown that f of t is equal to the sum from minus infinity to infinity, f of k over p, sink of p, I'm, I'll write it like this, t minus k over p. <coughs> we have interpolated all the values of the function at all values of t in terms of sampled values, evenly spaced points at k over p, all right? So my tk's in the way I originally formulated the problem are 1 over p, 2 over p, 3 over p, minus 1 over p, minus 2 over p, minus 3 over p, and so on and so on. If you know all those discrete values, then you can interpolate the, all the values of the function in terms of those. I think it's the most remarkable formula in the whole subject. So again, the assumption was, I want to go through this one more time, just to make sure you have this. This is called the sampling theorem, the sampling formula, sometimes called the Nyquist sampling formula. I'll get to Nyquist later. Sometimes called the Shannon sampling formula, sometimes called the Whitaker sampling formula. It's associated with a lot of names. Unfortunately, my name is not associated with this formula, despite how much I love it. All right, so again, the assumption is that if the Fourier transform of f is 0 for s greater than or equal to p over 2, then the, you have this formula for the function, sum from minus infinity to infinity f of k over p, sink p times k, t minus k over p. All right, now, for me, the sampling formula is identical with the proof of the sampling formula. All right? And that's important because I think next time we're going to talk about, I don't think I'm going to push this next this time, we'll talk about when things go wrong as well as when things go right. But for me, I never think of this formula alone in isolation without the miracle equation that makes it work. All right? So this is depend, all depending on the fact that if you periodize the Fourier transform and then cut off, you get the Fourier transform back. That this is the rectangle function of spacing of, of with p times the Fourier transform of f convolved with the Shaw function of spacing p. All right? It followed, although I tried to stretch it out for dramatic purposes, it follows immediately, lightning fast, just very mechanically by applying the inverse Fourier transform from this formula. This is what's essential. All right? And so for me, and I'm serious about this, the sampling formula, this formula is identical with the proof of the sampling formula. All right? To understand this formula is to understand this formula. They are the same. Okay, they are the same. It's a consequence of the Fourier transform swapping multiplication and convolution and writing this down. It's a simple but, but exceedingly cunning idea. I mean, why do something like that? You know, why, why it's, it, it, it seems like you're not going to do anything. You're periodizing and then cutting off and you get back the original function. What, it's like proving one is equal to one. What is the big deal? You know, but the fact is that the reason why something non-trivial happens is because of this remarkable fact that the Fourier transform in going back and forth between the two domains swaps multiplication and convolution. You have a combination of both of them, in fact. You have multiplication and convolution in the frequency domain. 
You take the inverse Fourier transform, you have multiplication and convolution in the time domain, but the roles are swapped. All right? That's why periodizing in the frequency domain turned into sampling in the time domain. All right? Because of this formula and because of the way the Fourier transform swaps multiplication and convolution. All right. I'll tell you what. Since it's been my habit to keep people late in class, I think instead today we'll get out early. All right. Uh, I want to talk about more about the consequences of this remarkable formula next time, including, sad to say, when things go wrong. But when things go wrong, they can all be explained by when this formula is not correct, <laughs> when something is not right with this formula. So we'll talk about the phenomena of aliasing and things like that. That's the sort of so-called, you might think of that as a natural phenomena associated with uh, sampling. But it's all based on this formula. So for me, and again, for you, you should think of the formula as identical, the sampling formula as identical with the proof of the sampling formula. I think if you do that, you'll never go wrong. Okay, that's it for today. I'll see everybody later.